I want to outline some of the reasons why I think uh, uh, international law, the international legal system is actually in a deep political crisis. And I think that currently there is a legitimacy problem for most of the instruments of international law out there. And it's often uh, when I read newspapers, when I look at cases, it's often portrayed as if non-Western states are reacting to the international legal system because they want to do what they want. They want to commit the atrocities they want. They want to be free to do whatever they want. There is often a one-sided sort of narrative there, which I don't find particularly compelling. And I'm going to outline the main reasons uh, right now. The first one is that resistance against the international legal system has always been there and has actually started with what I call hegemonic resistance. Now, you probably heard about the term exceptionalism, refers to the hegemon in place who actually acts as if it was superior to the rules of the internationals of international society. Now, this is not acceptable at the international legal level, simply because laws should not be ideated with a hierarchy of states in mind, a hierarchy who sh- that shields most powerful states from uh, international legal prosecution. But if we look at what George W. Bush said about the International Criminal Court in the early 2000s, is that this is to inform you that in connection with the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court adopted in 1998, So four years before, the United States does not intend to become part to the treaty. Accordingly, the United States has no legal obligations arising from its signature on December 31st, 2000. So the first step of hegemonic resistance was a sort of narratively uh, funded resistance that said we are not going to ratify the ICC treaty and as such, because of how international law works, we are not subject to its rulings. It's interesting to note that since 2003 or between 2002 and 2005, the US has cut over $20 million in international military education and training for a military financing to those countries to sign bilateral immunity agreements with the United States. What does it mean? That there were states, for instance, in South America that ratified the uh, International Criminal Court and actually became subject to the International Criminal Court. This means that if crimes were committed on the grounds of these states by United States forces, uh, the United States would have become uh, subject to the International Criminal Court because the geographical space in which it would have committed the crimes was subject to the ICC. So the United States started going around and make uh, these, not only South American, actually many African states, many Middle Eastern states, they created this form of agreement, which is a bilateral immunity agreement that stated that whatever happens in those situations, the hosting state of the conflicts would never be able to refer uh, the United States to the International Criminal Court. The threat for those states that refused to sign these bilateral immunity agreements and actually denounced the US for making them sign these bilateral immunity agreements was a huge cut in in monetary funding. So the first step is that um, it's not clear to me why we only speak about um, non-Western resistance to instruments of international legality. Having said that, there is no doubt that since 2009, at least, many African states, for instance, and many Middle Eastern states have started voicing their concerns with the international legal system and actually threatened to pull out. This was in concomitance with the release of warrants of arrest against Omar al-Bashir, simply because, in my opinion, African states mainly realized that the International Criminal Court was going after sitting heads of state and not just red. And this would undermine many leaders' positions. And as such, they started saying either that the prosecution of sitting heads of state was uh, unacceptable at the international level, or that the ICC as a whole was a tool of Western imperialism. As we might see, uh, it is not hard to see why that narrative was actually incredibly powerful and 
extremely convincing in many instances. But what I wanted to point out is that uh, there is no denying that, that many non-Western states, along with many Western states, actually started resisting the International Criminal Court and all the values it embodied. The last, perhaps, indicative form of resistance that emerged against the International Criminal Court was in concomitance of the ratification of the crime of aggression. So basically, international uh, lawyers established that one of the major causes for so much violence in international society is actually what we might want to call the crime of aggression or a state actually pushing the boundaries of sovereignty towards another state's sovereignty. It's interesting to know that this amendment to the International Criminal Court statute was ratified when, just after Russia and China, vetoed a potential referral of the Syrian situation to the International Criminal Court. Uh, following that, Russia withdrew from the Rome Statute, supporting the, all those forms of resistance against the ICC that were already expressed by the United States and African states. More recently, France and the UK refused to sign the inclusion of the crime of aggression to the crimes that the ICC actually covers. So France and the UK refused to sign that kind of uh, crime, which would have made them subject potentially, to, the, to investigations for crime of aggressions. And this is the question for you. Uh, it seems to me that there are very specific reasons that the US had to oppose the International Criminal Court, very pragmatic reasons that African states had to oppose um, the International Criminal Court and that France and the UK have to oppose the International Criminal Court. In my opinion, these are very self-interested reasons portrayed by grand narratives. But I will ask you what you think the main reasons for this resistance. It might be really easy to see why African states pointed out that there are new imperial underpinnings to the court's proceedings. And it's actually the subject of one of our debates. I wanted to show you this brief map which shows the current open investigations of the ICC and as you can see there is a geographical disproportion there which is quite evident along with the fact that there are three macro areas where the ICC has no jurisdiction unless the Security Council actually activates it and these areas are the Middle East, the United States and China. So to recap what we did today was focused a lot on the controversies that emerge uh, associated with these instruments of justice and mainly uh, that can be traced to the sovereignty, internationalist, globalization, cosmopolitanism triad. I think that it's fundamental for us to focus on the problematics of these institutions, essentially to ask ourselves if they can be saved, if they should be saved, or if they should be replaced by something more effective that perhaps was already there in the past but requires certain moral compromises that nobody is willing to make.